So first of all, good morning, and it's a pleasure to be here and actually feel at home again because I spent a, a number of years in telecom, 20 years in telecom, so all of the acronyms that Robert mentioned, like NFV and IoT and SDN and 4G, 5G, LTE, I kind of understood what he meant. So I shortened the, the title a little bit um, just in the interest of space on the slide because it's a pretty long title, but I think um, the, the, the presentation will stay true to, to the, the original title. So just a little bit in terms of what I do at, at IBM, um, I manage three de development teams. Um, one of them, uh, one of the team actually work on the statistics, and this product is actually used by a lot of um, universities, uh, researchers, um, in teaching, in analyzing data. A second um, development team works on a product we call the modeler. It's used by data scientists to, to build predictive models, such as machine learning models. And another team that I manage um, is responsible for building the algorithms that are actually being consumed by these first two products, but also by Watson machine learning. Anybody heard of Watson? Right. Okay, so, so we, we contribute to this. Uh, my second um, task at IBM is I manage uh, the machine learning hub in, in Markham, Ontario. So when we're outside of Canada, we just say machine learning hub in Toronto. Um, it's a location where we bring clients, um, startups, established enterprise um, to collaborate on machine learning challenges. And I'll touch a little bit um, on what it, what it is and some of the activities that we've done. Today, I want to touch a little bit, and I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see properly, <laughs> um, about digital business and the disruption that's happening. And I know we're here about telecom, but as you will see, there's a lot of disruption happening um, also inside of telecom. So you've heard of Uber. You've heard of YouTube. You've heard of Alibaba, for example, Amazon. And you also heard of um, companies such as, um, oh, apologies, it's, it's moving. Let's go back. All right, so it's, it's, it's probably on a timer, so you may wanna check it out. Um, so all of these companies are really disrupting the, the industries. So if you look at what's happening, um, a lot of these companies didn't exist a few years ago, four, five, maybe 10 years ago. And IBM actually did a survey where they surveyed a number of industries, and 72% of these companies actually say that, um, that they believe that their industry, their line of business will be transformed or disrupted in the next three years. That's three years. And three years, think of three years in, in, in terms of telecom and how long we've been talking about SDN and NFV, um, IoT. And only 23% of these companies actually had a plan in terms of how they would respond to this disruption. So this is very, very unnerving. And the major disruption is happening in terms of data. So if you look what's happening, we are talking about um, high-speed access. It's all about data. Um, we call a cognitive system, the systems actually that I understand and reason can almost think like a person, and the cloud. And I know that cloud is actually one of the topics being discussed over here today. So these three major I would say um, trends are actually having a major disruption in a lot of different industries. And regardless of the industry, and when Robert had his map here, I was thinking the same thing, right? Education, finance, mining, um, government. Uh, regardless of this industry, they're getting disrupted, right? Telecommunication being another one of them. And we all know what's happening in terms of telecom, what we used to call the ITification of the telecommunication networks, right? NFV moving things to the cloud and how it's changing quite a lot of the telecommunication landscape. So the impact is gonna be billions of dollars on in these industries, right? Just in terms of uh, maybe growth, some new organization, some new companies, or some companies getting acquired and merged, and some of them disappearing. So in terms of the entire landscape, regardless of an industry, it will change. Now if you look at the telecommunication industry itself, if we zoom in in the large telecom operators, 61% of them when they say, who are your competitors? They typically would say Google, or Facebook, Amazon. So you can imagine the, 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 the competitive landscape is also changing. And this is very unnerving. Uh, just to put it in perspective, Amazon spent last year about over $16 billion in development and R&D. 
And I was looking at Robert's chart in terms of um, the investment of the, these, these different companies, and when compared to Amazon, it's very significant. It's 10, 20, sometimes 100 times what a tier one would invest in development. So how do they keep pace with these companies that are really changing the environment? And if you look at the pressure that they face in terms of over-the-top applications, how are they going to compete? How are they going to keep their customers? So even in, within the telecommunication space today, there is a lot of AI being discussed, implemented, uh, leveraged to really respond to the competitive landscape. So we believe that AI and data science is actually the next agents of disruption within that space. So when we look at, we move the telecom infrastructure into an IT environment, it provides a lot of flexibility, a lot of flexibility, uh, a lot of opportunities actually to create some really cool applications. And there was a survey done by IDC. You can see that 69% of the operators are starting to invest in AI-related te technologies, right? A lot of them are using AI um, to reduce the customer churn. That means to keep the customer happy. How do you respond to customers that are at risk of going to your competitor? And yesterday I was at a town hall and I was doing a demonstration. We had a town hall at IBM, which we broadcast globally. And it, the use case was about a bank, and a bank using AI to be able to respond to the clients, to be able to, 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 to drive personality, in, personality insights about the client's tweets, what they tweet about, um, um, create an image of the client, do what we call a, 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 a probability of predicting whether or not that, that client is, is, will most likely live to another bank, and what type of actions the bank could do or could offer to the client. The same applies to telecom. We had an operator um, yes, two days ago in our machine learning hub, a uh, Canadian operator, and we spent an entire day in, in the hub talking about machine learning and working through some use cases. And they're actually using machine learning to reduce, for example, their call center whole time because they want to keep the clients happy, right? So there's a lot of behind the scenes um, machine learning and AI data science happening even in the telecom space. So what is data science? And it's a very long, long sentence, but I think I, the things that I want to point to is just those that are highlighted in white, right? Different fields, computer science, mathematics, engineering, right? IT, algorithms, right? To drive um, different insights, programming languages. And as you will see, uh, when you look at um, the, whole idea, the whole area of data science, machine learning, AI, there's a lot of open source. And, and, and Robert touched on that, and I'll touch on that a little bit. So there's a lot happening in terms of what data science is. But then there's the big discussion about artificial intelligence, what it is, because there's a slight differentiation. But you could say that it's an umbrella in terms of when we talk about AI, is to get in machines to behave and predict and, and, and almost act kind of human-like, right? And, and I, I, I think it was, um, I was speaking to Odi, I think, when we, we, I said we talk about AI, and he said the aliens. Well, it's not the aliens, right? It is really getting machines to be as smart as humans. And we almost get in there. And machine learning is just a subset of AI. You could see an application within AI where you can actually take machines and refer them all to computers, feed them a lot of historical data, and get them to do predictions, to learn from the historical data. And an example that I use, uh, typically use is that uh, as a child, um, you know, how did you know that if you put your finger in the fire, it was going to burn, right? Maybe your parents said, don't put your finger in the fire. Or if you have, like me, one of my son, he would probably put his finger in the fire and let him feel, right? So, so you either learn by actually historical data or somebody give you the information. So this is what machine learning is all about. You learn by historical data. And when we look at telecoms, it's all about data. And I know we have a lot of people here from the telecom infrastructure space today where you provide the pipe, you, you see the data, you analyze data. You could drive a lot of insights from the data. In fact, we had um, one of the telecom operators, um, Canadian-based telecom operators. Uh, they wanted to look at the wireless network protocols. And, and I said to them, I actually thought I live wireless, and now I'm back in wireless because now you want me to use machine learning back into the wireless, right? Because there's a lot of data, there's a lot of insights you can drive. And they wanted to use machine learning to drive insights from the wireless protocol data so that it can help address customer experience, to improve the customer experience, right? So there's a lot about data that you can use machine learning for. So here is the, 
we call a Venn diagram, so you're back in school. But you can see that machine learning is actually a subset of artificial intelligence. And there's another area called deep learning, which is uh, it's machine learning, but way much more complex. So anybody hear about Google TensorFlow? Yeah, where you could feed an image in and it would say, hey, this is a cat, as opposed to a dog, or to, opposed to a flower. Um, that's deep learning. So a lot of these, these, these technologies are being used today. A lot of it is actually open source in the sense that it can be used uh, to drive very, very deep experience of deep, deep um, um, analysis that you wouldn't be able to do with your, your naked eye. So you might say, well, this stuff is far-fetched. It's, you know, uh, what is machine learning, what is AI? The reality, it's been used today. It's been used by companies like Netflix and by Amazon um, to determine what they should present to you as an end user. And the way that it works is that they will look at your preferences, your viewing preferences, or your buying, your purchasing preferences, compared to all of the other customers that whatever they looked at, what they bought, and they use algorithms in the, in the back end to be able to predict what you most likely would like to see next, or most likely want to buy. So we've all been influenced, but most likely most of you have probably done your shopping on Black Friday at Amazon, and you see recommendation, or when you log into Netflix, you will see something like this. It's being used by the airline industries to determine what's the best price to offer, you know, and as you get closer and closer to your departure time, you'll see the price changes, and they have to make this determination in such a point, in such a way that they can keep the seats full, right? Because every time an airline leaves with an empty seat, that's a loss of money. Hotels, and also by companies such as Walmart. In fact, companies like Walmart have hundreds of data scientists behind crunches of numbers to determine what's the best product to them to, for, the, for, for which store, in which location, what demographics, at what time of the year. And they've incorporated um, information like, like weather data to determine what's, what to offer at a particular store. Because if you're a company like Walmart, where you have a just-in-time inventory, where you don't really store anything in the store, you want to make sure you maximize um, your sales in the stores, right? The weather company, you will say, what does weather have to do with it? And I'm not sure most of you are probably aware that IBM actually bought the weather company. And you say, why would IBM buy a weather company? Well, the weather influences a lot of things, right? For me personally, I'm from the islands, so when it's winter time, I hibernate. So you can imagine, I, I don't go out shopping, I, I don't want to be in traffic. It influences what I buy and how I live my life, right? But it also influences, it will have impact on transportation, right? Because if you're moving goods from A to B and the weather is bad and you have perishable goods, you may have a problem. Or if you're moving goods from A to B and you need to get your goods on time because you have an empty shelf and you have a bad weather, you have a problem, right? So you can use weather information to do prediction, but also to do things like scheduling because weather is a very, very important factor, right? Uh, we were working with a client, actually, uh, a bank, and they wanted to incorporate weather into the machine learning um, problem, or you want to say the, the, the model, because they have all these branches. And they know that when the weather is bad, like in wintertime, um, if you have a snowstorm or whatever the case may be, they have less pedestrian coming to the bench. So they want to use that to determine, in terms of their scheduling flexibility, where they should have uh, moved their employees around. Because as you know, the banks are under tremendous pressure. You know, most, most people don't go to the bank. But they still want to be very efficient with their resources. Self-driving car, that's machine learning. Right? And one of the ways that they've done it is to take the car and drive it, let human drive the car, uh, collect a lot of data, and the car will actually learn from human. And so you have all this data, you're training this model in the car, and when the car finds itself in a certain situation, it can determine uh, what's the best way to, to respond to it. But also, if you think of um, a self-driving car in a city, right? In a real-world scenario, the car needs to make a decision. Uh, that object next to me, is it a car? Is it a human, pedestrian? Is this a stop sign? Is the light green? Does it say no left turn or no right turn? Or is it a cat or a dog? 
right? So those type of images need to be fed in. And in real time, that car needs to make decision about what type of um, input is this and what, how it's going to react to it, right? This is also what we call machine learning. And another cool application is it's being used in the, the medical industry so that they can now feed in an X-ray or MRI and with higher, higher degree of probability in terms of accuracy, it'd be able to tell you exactly what's wrong with you. I was at a conference earlier this year, and there was a startup company, actually, and they're looking at building an application. In fact, they had it. I just didn't want to test it on my hand. I didn't want to get the results. But basically, the idea is that if you have a mole on your hand, they could take an image and have high level of um, probability to tell you if it's cancerous or not. Right? So you can imagine how those type of technologies are actually changing. It's changing a lot, a lot of ways um, how we, we, we work, we interact. But you can imagine the type of innovation and how it's going to transform a lot, a lot of industries. We have somebody from the CRA, right? You think about it, machine learning also can be used in those type of applications. When you submit the tax, in real time, it could score it and say, well, this looks like a fraudulent tax. Maybe we should do an audit, right? It's been used in those type of environment um, to be able to look at, um, if you want to say, outlier patterns, abnormalities that, that they should take a, a deeper look at. In fraud, insurance fraud, banking fraud, right? So, so in real time, for example, if you have a credit card and you use your credit card, in real time, you swipe a credit card, the banks would want to know is this transaction fraudulent? Should we pay special attention to that? In fact, in our machine learning hub in, in, in Silicon Valley, um, they were working on a use case for a very large company um, out of Las Vegas. And they wanted to do a fraud machine learning application so they can identify those transactions, whether it's in the restaurant, whether it's the casino, whether or not they're fraudulent. So it's a very, very powerful application. And by Google. So when you go to Google and you start typing, you wonder, I wonder why it knows exactly what I'm looking for. It's because it's using machine learning to do predictions. So it's all of, all of us, um, in one way, shape, or form, we're impacted in machine learning. And I'm not sure if you, you heard about uh, this guy over here, Watson, in Jeopardy in 2011, right? Being able to, 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 to win, right, in Jeopardy. And what's... There's something called natural language processing, which is basically what I speak. Um, Watson, for example, can interpret that and know exactly what I'm saying, right? But it can also detect um, things like tone. And I think uh, Robert, was it Robert that mentioned tone? Right? Um, tone. But also there's something called sentiment analysis, where you can detect whether or not the person is in a good mood in a bad mood, right? Whether they're tweeting in a negative or a positive way. We had a bank that, um, that wanted to do... Um, tweet analysis. Uh, they wanted to do a tweet analysis on Donald Trump tweet. Because when he tweeted about a company, what happens if it's a bad, negative tweet? Stock price goes down, right? But they also wanted to look at um, uh, Twitter analysis for individuals, of different companies. They wanted to, to, to read text, um, um, corporation statements, so that they can feed into their, their, their traders. Their traders can make decisions. Um, in real time uh, about um, different type of corporations, right? And whether or not they should invest in it. And in telecom, uh, predictive maintenance. Imagine, we talk about IoT. Those IoT are going to be deployed in very, very remote locations, right? Some of them will be mission critical. What if you could predict ahead of time whether or not this device is going to fail? Then you can be proactive in your maintenance, right? Think about it, you have a, a cloud infrastructure, you have a critical network infrastructure. What if you could predict five minutes ahead of time that this infrastructure is most likely to fail? We have an application actually that would do that, where you are monitoring a system, you're looking at the logs and, and the alarms and the memory usage and the fan and, and all the different types of sensors you have into the system. And using historical data, you can make a prediction whether or not this device can say, will fail. So that means you can be proactive. So think of a telecommunication network that will never fail, right? This is actually feasible. So what is data science and what is machine learning? Because it does look kind of foreign if you're out of that space. 
it's not as complicated as it, as it actually sounds, right? So I mentioned you get data. You need to understand exactly what the use case is. So if you're bank, banking and your manager came to you and said, I want to do a fraud detection application, you ask exactly what do I need. If you're in telecom and you say, we want to be able to run an application to identify um, the customers that are most likely to leave us and go to the competitor, then you need to know what the application is. So understanding your data is very critical. Um, cleaning your data, you apply machine learning, and voila, as easy as that, you have an application that you can use. It seems very simple. So I'll make you machine learning experts in two slides. So you have data, you apply algorithms. Remember I said that I had a development team, that's all I do. They work on algorithms. A team of data scientists, engineers, researchers, work with universities, they look at the algorithms, they use open source when, it's, when we can, we extend it if, we, if it doesn't meet a requirement. But the algorithms are actually the heart of the machine learning capability, right? So here you have your data, you train. So there are certain terminologies we use in machine learning. You have your data, which contains patterns, because all the data, there, there's some sort of pattern in the data. We just can't see it, right? You train your algorithm. You, you algorithm recognize the patterns that you never be able to recognize as a human eye. We build models. The model is like an application. So if you're a, a telecom operator, and I call, Alvin Francis is on the line, in real time, they should be able to score me and say, is Alvin a high-risk customer? Right? So somebody needs to call it, the application needs to call it. If you're a telecom operator and they want to reduce the um, their, their wait time in the call center, they need to be able to make a determination, what is Alvin calling for? So they wanted to, 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 to be able to route based on what they believe I'm calling about. Right? So you build your model, you deploy it, you get new data, and then you make predictions. So that's all you have to remember about machine learning at a very high level. Okay? And machine learning, um, there's something called supervised learning and unsupervised learning. I will not get into in too much in detail. But you could think that in supervised learning, if you were, um, if you were a, a bank and you were doing, for, get, for example, mortgage application, you would have a list of customers that have probably defaulted or didn't default in the mortgage application. So they have labels. And you can use that to train the model. But if, you have, uh, if you're trying to segment your customers, like you are Rogers or Bell or Telus here, and you wanted to know what type of special offer that you should provide and to whom, then you create clusters. You allow the, the machine learning model to find patterns and create clusters and say, this cluster of customers will most likely want to upgrade to an iPhone XX, 10, right? And this cluster of customer, maybe I offer them just more bandwidth, right? So you can create this type of clusters and you can actually segment your different clients. But also image recognition. So you remember I mentioned about the self-driving car. Here's an image. What is it? Is it another car or is it a dog? Or is it a human? Is it a stop sign? So these are actually the very, very, very popular um, algorithms that are used in this, this area. And we embrace a lot of open source. So as, I like to say, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, open source is the big aspect of machine learning and the AI space. So really, uh, it's a very, I would say, not necessarily an easy entry, but you don't have to build it yourself. So even at IBM, as a big company, as Robert was mentioning about company embracing the open source, we really embrace and contribute to open source. In fact, our, what we call our data science experience platform, which was actually built for data scientists, uh, a lot of these components actually come from open source. We add value on top of it. Because the reality, it doesn't make any sense right now for any company to say, I'm going to compete with something that's free, right? So you leverage it, you bring your value to it, um, and then you, you recontribute back. With open source, obviously, it's deployment is easier, but also the adoption curve is, is much less, it's not as, not as steep. So all of these technologies plus more, there are a lot of other technologies that we use in, in, at IBM for our data science experience. And we also have a very collaborative environment. Uh, which is very important for the adoption of any new technology. And we've created these five hubs globally uh, to collaborate with clients. And we like to say we don't discriminate. Regardless of the size of the organization, uh, regardless of your challenge, it's free, right? You come to a hub, we work with you for machine learning challenge, right? So we work with startup. We brought a startup in, um, and I'll show a, sh a short demo at the end. 
two individuals. They're working on a coaching application. They believe machine learning can bring some value to them. And we started working with them, explaining to them what machine learning is, and actually brought our data scientists into the discussion and get them, get them started in that area. But we also work with very uh, established companies. I mentioned we've had banks, we've had insurance companies, we had telecom operators. Um, we have discussion with the government. Um, regardless of the industry, it's a collaborative environment. And this is something that we do just to get um, clients, if you want to see, along on their journey in the machine learning space. And if you're new to machine learning and you just wanted to take a machine learning one-on-one -on -one course, we'll do that. Right? We'll give you some use case, and we'll teach you what machine learning is. Or if you want to bring specific challenge to a hub, and there are some use cases that what we call dreams, you know, like because the technology can do a lot of different things, right? And some up, some companies are trying to be innovative, and, and in this space you have to be innovative. If you're a telecom operator or vendor, you say, how do I differentiate, right? You don't want to copy what your competitor is doing. You want to innovate. And if you think of what's happening with telecom, if the transformation that's happening. Um, the comp the, the, your competitor is not going to necessarily be a next telecom operator or next telecom vendor, right? Because as this space is getting to be more IT, more cloud, your competitors are all over the place, right? So this is a quote from one of our GM, right? We believe machine learning is going to be huge. We're just starting the process. And we're faster and faster computing. With faster GPUs, with things like TensorFlow, uh, which can do some really, really deep analysis, it's going to really transform every industry, whether you're in telecom, whether you're in the operator space, whether you're in the manufacturer space, whether you're in infrastructure, whether you're in the application, it's going to change, right? And if you think what's happening today in telecom, it's really changing. It's a, it's a lot of... Um, Mergers, some of the companies, I know we have companies there like uh, Ribbon that, that merged re recently. And I was reading a, an article the other day about um, the effect of the transformation that's happening in telecom. Um, in India, India where we have uh, some very large operators, they were saying that in the next two years, they'll have 150,000 job losses as a result of telecom um, disruption, right? There was another article that I read um, that talks about um, the number of, of, of job losses within the operator environment as they transform and they move into an IT space and they try to innovate and they try to compete with the um, Amazon and the Googles of the world, right? It's a lot of transformation happening where they try to be much more agile, right? And those technologies actually, they have to leverage them because they have to find ways to innovate and differentiate. And telecom, we, a lot of time we used to say it's about data. Data, data, data. But data is the new gold mine, right? Because there's a lot of information that you can use and you can drive into data. And this is what AI and machine learning is allowing us to do. So I know we have a track about um, 5G IoT and, and the transformation that's moving to 5G IoT. That's a question for the telecom industry. What should machine learning do in that domain, right? I was it was um, yesterday morning. I was um, just having my breakfast, looking at television. And there was an ad from Verizon. And the ad was a, a fisherman with a catch of fish on a boat. And they were talking about an application where they put a sensor, an IoT device, on that catch of fish. And they could track where the, the, the destination from, from source to destination the different temperature, you know, the, the environment in which that fish, fish will transit as it goes from the catch, from the fisherman, to its destination. Now, why would you want to do that? It's an IoT device. Why, why would you want to do that? Think of it. If you could predict the shelf life of that fish, right, as it goes through different temperature, it's going to impact the shelf life. And if a, a retailer can predict ahead of time, that this fish from this fisherman is probably got a shelf life of two weeks or three weeks or a week, then they can react to that, right? Because a fish caught in the, in the Arctic is different than a fish that's caught in the islands, right? Where the temperature is different, right? This is an IoT application, right? And I was just thinking, hey, this is IoT. But also it's IoT with data being transmitted over an IoT network. 
uh, with machine learning to be able to do the prediction on shelf life, right? It's the same with the uh, other IoT devices. As you have the, how many millions of IoT devices, I think Robert said, millions and millions of IoT devices, uh, how are you gonna optimize your network to carry this device? How are you gonna predict your traffic? And think about, um, I know we talk about um, self-organizing networks, but what if you had a network that could predict the traffic, not necessarily based on people moving around, but over the weather, right? Because the weather is gonna influence movement. It's gonna influence patterns. What about if it could be based on actually self-driving cars traffic? How is it gonna impact it? So think about this technologies and try to understand how those new technologies are actually gonna change the industry that you're in. And whether you're a network operator or communication service provider, how are you gonna differentiate? It's a tough space, right? But that's where you have to look out. You gotta look outside of your domain and the innovation that's happening there to understand how it's gonna impact you. 10 years ago, how many of us thought that um, cloud would impact telecom? Maybe none of us, right? We were in our little domain and all of a sudden, NFV, everything moves to the cloud so quick, right? So we gotta keep your eye open. And even if we look at it, Etsy has recognized that, right? And so they've started this um, new specification group. Well, look at the goal, right? improve operators' exper experience with respect to deployment and operations by using AI techniques, right? So we are the tip of the iceberg. And I think Sengen, obviously you're gonna have a role to play because it's next generation network, right? What's the next generation network gonna look like? What's the next generation network architecture gonna look like? What's the next generation application gonna look like, right? This is what we should be looking when we look at innovation, right? How are we gonna change the landscape? How are we gonna compete? How are we gonna differentiate? How are we gonna drive innovation? That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>